So uh, welcome. For, uh, thank you for joining us this morning at super not late or early, but somebody followed the three, two, one rule to the letter last night, sorry. didn't they? Yeah, sorry, yeah. my bad. Hey, but at least I got three. So, uh, in case you don't know where you are, we're doing Volans 101 in here. Uh, hopefully, everyone can learn a little bit of something. We all wanted to ask a couple of questions before we jump in further. Um, number one, like, how many people here is their first DEF CON? Wow. All right, nice. That's pretty Very impressive. Nice. So how many, uh, what was the other question we want to ask? So how many of you here are, are here for this talk? You've just started out in vulnerability research and you want to uh, learn how to improve your game. Okay, and how, need you. And, and how many of you are not familiar with research, but you're curious about it, and so that's why you came here? That's about even. Okay, good. That doesn't help us any, but thanks. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, what we realized a little bit uh, earlier this week as we were practicing was that we were trying to target two audiences, uh, newbies and then people who were curious about vulnerability research but didn't know much about it. And so sometimes for those who are curious about it, we might go into some terminology you might not be fully familiar with. Um, we're just going to move on. We'll be glad to follow up with you afterwards as well. Yeah, and neither of us hide on the internet. We're pretty approachable, so don't be afraid of us. So introduction, I'm uh, Josh, J-Duck, I go by on the internet. That's how you find me there. Uh, I've been doing VR for 20 years, and so this, this 20 years actually includes several years as a hobbyist. Uh, and at one point, I ran the iDefense Vulnerability Contributor Program where we would actually buy vulnerabilities from researchers and get them fixed and coordinate and all that stuff. So I've, that's how I met Steve, and we, we did a fair amount of work together at that point. Yep. And uh, we met through the uh, CVE program, which I was a co-founder of, and led from 1999 until uh, the end of last year, basically. Um, there is a thing called responsible disclosure. I am a survivor of the responsible disclosure wars. I now call them coordinated disclosure. I coined the responsible disclosure term for which I will be eternally sorry, but it served its purpose. I uh, started getting into um, classification of vulnerabilities as well, which is where CWE comes from. And uh, I was also a participant in the development of CVSS version 2. One so, quick question. How many people in here have a CVE to their name? All right, let's fix that. That was like a dozen, I think. Yep. That's pretty good. So uh, why are we doing this? We want to fix that, right? We want more people out there doing research into vulnerabilities of software and hardware into all kinds of systems because, uh, as we've seen, there's lots of crazy things possible. Uh, it was very interesting to see the previous talk, the guy hacking the loyalty program. That's... Uh, it's good stuff. It's fun. So, um, what else? We have this little tiny picture on a slide on here. It's like tiny. If anyone works, <laughs> you guys at, see the slides better than we do. So we're flying <laughs> yeah, a little bit really blind. Weird. But if anybody uh, works at Google Slides, you might need to work on this thing. We can uh, we can move on. All right. Yeah. So just to get people involved. So disclaimer up front. Right. This is our opinion. We did a lot of stuff with Volans over the years. Find them, analyze them, all that stuff, and uh, you know. We just formulated these opinions, so that they may not be right for you. Uh, take that with a grain of salt, and, and you know, remember that that you're that you're your own person, and you got to find your own path. Uh, we'll just try to help you see some of the stuff. So, mm -hmm. last, lastly, there's no new exploits here. If you came here for who came here to see new exploits? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, there's a question about what is a vulnerability in the first place, and we'll start with what a vulnerability is not. One of the most commonly confused uh, terms is uh, exploit versus vulnerability, and a lot of people think that exploit and vulnerability actually mean the same thing. Uh, however, they don't, and, and exploit is really a sequence of steps that's used to take advantage of a vulnerability. A vulnerability is a problem within the code itself that just kind of more or less uh, sits there uh, waiting to be uh, waiting to be exploited. These are almost circular sounding terms, but we um, we face a number of difficulties in actually really defining these a little bit more carefully. And I think that's a reflection partially of um, the relative immaturity of the vulnerability research uh, specialty. Yeah, I wish I could expand this picture for you, but I think what does Taylor Swift say here? To to uh, 
to be loved is to be vulnerable. Uh, to, I got to love is to be vulnerable, and to be loved is the the greatest sex greatest sex right? That's awesome. Pretty good quote. So we we go back and forth with this definition of what is a vulnerability, uh, and there's so many different ways to define it. I think Steve did a great job already saying it. Uh, one of the biggest things really is that you have some kind of impact on a system. Uh, if if uh, you don't have some kind of impact or you're not changing the way things are working, it's pretty much not a vulnerability. A uh, buddy of mine, Greg McManus at iDefense, taught me, like, you know, through through uh, heavy abuse of him asking me this question every time I taught him I thought I found something. So he's like, well, what do you have and what do you get? You know, and if, if what you are getting from this vulnerability, if you manage to exploit it, is not better in some way than what you started with, then you do not have a vulnerability. It's, uh, it's more like a bug or something really annoying. And this is one of the common problems we run across with, uh, with new researchers who try and report CVEs or something like that. They find something that may be a bug or may actually be a feature, but it's something that is legitimately already allowed. Or somebody, or with the privileges you already have, you can already go legitimately through some other route to uh, uh, obtain those uh, additional capabilities. And so that's one particular point of confusion. Yep. So uh, an interesting, another important point to make about vulnerabilities is, uh, as Steve knows well with his classification work in CWE, that there are many, many properties of vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the, like I mentioned before, the impact is a really important one, uh, but also the user act, user interaction is an interesting one. <clears throat> These things are used by the defensive side to prioritize uh, patching and strategies uh, around defense. So um, these are just a couple of the important properties. How long, uh, another interesting one these days, which is getting more and more interesting, is how hard is this thing actually to exploit? And I think, you know, as things have improved over the years, it's gotten much harder to do that. So yeah, it's, it's become a lot more difficult uh, to do that. And um, that's uh, thanks to the defensive work and the uh, uh, buildup of many different kinds of protection mechanisms. And so there's almost like a Heisenbergian uh, approach to uh, interpreting vulnerabilities these days. Um, uh, where something was clearly exploitable perhaps 10 years ago, it may wind up taking a whole lot of work. And that's one of the great things about the defensive side of understanding vulnerabilities, which is to really build in these system systematic uh, defenses. I have a whole rant on this. We can do some other time, but not right now. We'll save that for later. Yeah. All right, so and finally we get to what is vulnerability research. And, and uh, in, in this case, what we're saying is... Uh, the process of analyzing a product protocol or algorithm. You guys already read. Or a specification so. <laughs> to basically to uh, to try and find vulnerabilities or understand them, uh, one or more vulnerabilities basically. So yeah. there are different uh, kind of approaches, different uh, different kinds of products or specifications and so on that you may decide to look at. It's all uh, more or less falls under the umbrella term of vulnerability research. However, the term itself is um, treated and interpreted a little bit differently. You might sometimes hear the term vulnerability discovery, and that's really uh, intended by, uh, used by people who want to distinguish from, let's say, academic strength research uh, versus going and uh, doing bug hunting and so on. So some people use that term. That distinction does wind up being important, I think, sometimes. Uh, but again, the, the terminology is still kind of emerging, and we don't have a lot of agreement. Well, again, we're not doing exploits here, and I, I personally think exploits uh, and exploit development and stuff like that falls into VR. But um, as do I. Yeah, but it, it's uh, it's not really our focus here. So let's let's keep going. It, it, it's really about um, uh, solving puzzles where you don't even know what the puzzle is in the first place. You don't even know if you'll find a puzzle. Then maybe you find a puzzle which leads you to other puzzles and so on. That's one of the big attractions to me for uh, vulnerability research. All right, so why do it? Uh, you know, if, in case you're very new and you're just curious, these are some reasons why you might want to get motivated to do the hard work that is vulnerability research. Uh, I can't read this stupid slide, man. <laughs> Hooray, Google Slides. I'm serious, it's so tiny. Speaker I hope there note, aren't any the Google speaker notes are the whole screen, yeah. and the slide is like a little tiny square. Hope there aren't any Google people in the room, but I hope there are, so they'll fix this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the big points to note here, as you look at this yeah. uh, nice little word cloud, is uh, go ahead. 
Ah, that's yeah. okay. I, right. Let's just go to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> the, the main takeaway from that previous slide is that uh, there are many different motivations that different researchers oh, yes, have. That one. And, and your motivations may not be the same as others. And in addition, when you're dealing with vendors, vendors may have only experienced or they may only assume certain kinds of motivations from you. And so that potentially causes uh, uh, certain difficulties when interacting with vendors. I personally like just about all these words on here. Uh, I don't know. So uh, there's a lot of different careers. Steve, you want to talk to that? Yeah. So um, there's a number of different careers, but it's not like there's a um, you know a career shop that you can go to. This is still a new field. It, um, in to my way of thinking, we're like kind of entering the second generation. We're sort of the first generation. We're, we're trying not to skip one. We're trying. <laughs> And it's really good to see a full room here, actually, because we need a lot more uh, people doing vulnerability research because we've only, you know, seen the tip of the iceberg. But what's called vulnerability research, um, it, it may vary, but there's a lot of different things that one can do. Yes, you can go and you can hunt bugs and hunt vulnerabilities. Other people uh, may really like uh, building up exploits against those vulnerabilities. And I agree with Josh that uh, that's an aspect of vulnerability research. Then there's other stuff that's maybe a little bit more adjacent to vulnerabilities, but that still involves a lot of analysis. So I previously mentioned things like building defensive protection mechanisms to help pro protect against entire classes of uh, vulnerabilities. Um, you know, for CVE, a lot of what we did was to um, catalog those vulnerabilities and, in a way, try and figure out how the CVE identifier could be used to help uh, people to coordinate and so on. Um, and and a, another option is to uh, really work on fixing them. Uh, you could be working at a, a developer somewhere and uh, see a vulnerability that's been reported and figure out actually how to fix the code. And I guess one, one note that just uh, uh, popped in my mind here is that there are a lot of vulnerability researchers who discover vulnerabilities but have no idea actually how to fix them. It's a completely different mindset. You have to have, you can have a really um, solid development background. You need a solid development background to build a good fix but that's not necessarily um, the kind of skill you need to do vulnerability research. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one thing I will add uh, is that if you do start doing any of this stuff or find a job doing this stuff, you basically have unlimited job security <clears throat> for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so there's a lot of different employers that uh, you basically could have. Um, I mentioned, you know, you could work at a software vendor, you could work for a government organization or a cert coordinator. You could work at a, uh, a commercial enterprise, whether it develops security products or whether it does consulting services. Um, however, these days, pretty much every business that's out there is more or less a software developer. Think about Target. Think about other kinds of brick and mortar uh, you know, companies. Those all develop software, either in-house to help them manage their operations or externally with respect to uh, websites and so on. And as you all have probably heard, there is a huge demand. And so um, these are some of the options that you, could, uh, that you could look at, and you would be most likely welcomed with open arms by someone somewhere, because we need a lot more researchers. I, I, uh, I'm a little partial to the bounty programs. They're really fun. And uh, uh, if you have a good employer like I'm fortunate enough to do, then you can kind of keep that bonus money and throw parties at B-sides and stuff like that. Cheers. So, um, yeah, let's do the next one, huh? Uh, so, um, these next couple slides is really kind of um, a little bit more of a disclaimer than normal in terms of our opinion, but based on our personal experiences, and I've actually done some vulnerability research myself, it was a while ago, but based on our personal experiences and interacting with other researchers, um, there are a number of personality traits that generally seem to be um, useful for longer-term success within, uh, within vulnerability research. So, for example, a willingness to work uh, independently, a willingness to learn, um, being very uh, uh, critical thinking. You always have to be more or less questioning your own assumptions. That's and a it, good point. I don't even think that's in the slides, but that's a really yeah. good point. And uh, really, it's, it's a, primarily a solitary effort. You need to be, you need to be diligent. Um, and uh, you see some of the other some of the other features there, basically. But uh, two of the biggest personality traits that uh, that we believe are important are patience 
and persistence. Patience is essential not only with yourself and with the process of discovering and, and investigating these vulnerabilities, but patience when dealing with others, especially when dealing with, say, uh, vendors that might not necessarily be behaving exactly the way that you would want to when you're uh, trying to communicate with them. So those were some of the should have personality traits. These are some of the ones that we think are nice to have. Uh, st still a greater formula for success here. To really be able to be uh, focused, to, um, to seek to improve software, um, which is a, a common thing. The ability to collaborate, whether that's uh, to collaborate and work with other people is something that uh, we believe is important. There, there, is, there can be many rock stars and not so rock stars that don't work well uh, with other people. Um, but that oftentimes, especially if you're just starting out, I think is probably a career limiting uh, um, kind of attitude that one would take. And we also have here a uh, notion of having kind of an addictive personality. So for example, at CVE, you know, I stayed at CVE for 16 years through 70,000 vulnerabilities. Now I didn't investigate and look at all of them, but you could say that that might be kind of indicative of an addictive sort of personality. And Josh, you know, how many days, weeks, or months have you spent on, a, say, a single bug? I don't know. I stage fright has been going for <laughs> a long time. I think it's at, like, maybe one year. But, um, yeah, it's not all at the same time. So, we'll, we'll so you know, none of these personality traits here that we're talking about is absolutely essential. Each of you will find your own path. But if you feel that you have some of these personality traits, then you might find vulnerability research enjoyable. So I think we're going to be totally screwed on this slide because it's yeah. so small and over there. So we have a number you of different. You probably read it fine. Yeah. We can't read it at all. We have a number of different skills that we've sort of listed here for long-term success. But I would say probably that um, some of the some of the biggest ones. One is about uh, analysis tools and and findings. So not this one, is it? Yep. We can skip it on the next one too. All right. I think the big one we wanted to say here was about communication. I think we made that pretty clear. Uh, yeah. All right. So here's another awesome wall of text slide that we put together. And we don't want to read it to you, but uh, these are some of the key terms that we feel in vulnerability research. Of course, the slides will be available. Um, you know, if, you're, if you hear us, you probably already heard us use like some of these terms. Um, but when it really comes into doing analysis and deeper research, like some of the stuff like root cause analysis uh, and vulnerability chains and classes, uh, and especially proof of concept code, uh, become more important. I think one of the key uh, terms here that uh, um, I guess we touch on it a little bit later as well though is the notion of root cause analysis. This is where diligence and critical thinking comes comes into play. You might discover something that's like a symptom of a problem uh, and, and it's really when you become tenacious and dig deeper and deeper into it to find out what's really causing the problem in the first place uh, where um, you may find some uh, significant success. All right, so uh, in the industry, uh, many of you probably, if you're interested in vulnerability research already, uh, know about this thing we call the fire hose, and that's basically just a steady stream of information about vulnerabilities that's coming from all angles. Uh, it includes stuff like some of my favorite stuff, like CTFs in war games, <clears throat> where you can learn, <clears throat> excuse me, at your own pace, uh, and just lots of aggregation and other places. If you want to learn more about vulnerabilities, Look at these things for sure. There are a couple items that are not on that uh, on that list there that I think came, that came up during this week, and oh, yeah. uh, one of them actually is the Pony Awards because the Pony Awards often talk about you know individual bugs, and typically yeah. those additional bugs have uh, additional details. And then another area is uh, bug bounty programs, which uh, can oh, help you to learn stuff. and interact with others. Right. Uh, actually, by a show of hands, how many people are in or have participated in bug bounty programs and gotten some kind of reward? Why is it? I was wow. say it better not be okay. too much more than how many people have CVEs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving but I guess, on. But I guess there is that rule about CVEs and websites, right? So, um, wow. I'm going to bend over and stare really tinyly at it. So selecting your target, uh, there's a lot of choices if you want to find bugs somewhere. This is kind of on the vulnerability discovery side. Uh, you, know, you can go deep or you can go broad, and what we mean by that is uh, you can pick one particular type of vulnerability or something and go look at every software you can find 
to see if it's vulnerable, or you could pick one particular software and just drill down until you find something. There is a lot of software that has more or less uh, low-hanging fruit, and if you want to expand on that a little. I will. On the, uh, I don't know if it's on this slide or the next one. <laughs> so uh, we, another big point I wanted to make here is if you, if you do do some vulnerable research and you find nothing, it's actually quite useful for people to know that somebody looked, even if you found nothing. So that's, that's one point. Uh, and again, low-hanging fruit, a lot of older code is buggy. Uh, complex or overly complex stuff is uh, very interesting to look at, although, uh, you know, a lot of times you just get lost in it, just like the developer did. Uh, you know, large attack surfaces like web browsers are always fun to play with. You've got a lot of possibility for things to go wrong there. Um, software popularity matters. So if you're going to try to become super famous and you want to go find some vuln in something, it's probably better to not pick a random... Uh, personal website project off of uh, SourceForge or something like that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to find something in you know, a super popular product like Microsoft Windows Server or something, it, it's probably going to not be anywhere near as easy. Not necessarily anywhere as easy because that software, you know, the really popular software has already been pounded on and pounded on by many people, by elite researchers and so on. And so the lower hanging fruit, the kind of software that doesn't necessarily have, uh, that doesn't necessarily have any vulnerability history at all uh, or that no one's really looked at before, um, that's often uh, an area where you can find some success um, very quickly. Yeah. I don't know if, I, if it, yeah. So, one thing I like to do sometimes when I get super stuck uh, is to go and pick on somebody lame. Uh, I think this is kind of popular in the, in the VR industry where we just need that redemption. We need to feel good about ourselves again. Uh, and but the problem with that is, you know, like uh, a good example is like Open Office or something. It's it's pretty easy to fuzz that, and it's full of bugs, and nobody really cares about them too much. And so uh, you can go find bugs there, but then you deal with the secondary problem is nobody caring too much. So. Uh, so brand new emerging technologies is always a great place to look. Uh, many people in Vuln Research like to wait until a, a thing becomes very popular, and therefore when things are emerging, they, nobody's really paying attention. Uh, I think we can say that about IPv6. I think there's like maybe a handful of IPv6 researchers around, uh, even though that's sort of slowly becoming a norm. Um, let's see, mobile and IoT are definitely uh, guilty of this because as they tried to hurry up and get to market really fast, they didn't invest in security. And well, we're hoping that we don't repeat that mistake with IoT, but we'll see. Uh, one suggestion we do have, which would be um, very useful for the, uh, for the entire community and for contributing to the body of knowledge, is that you have access to software or products that are very uh, difficult for the everyday person to get access to. Say, you know, multi-million dollar enterprise software or... Uh, expensive medical devices or other kind of physical devices, um, you know, those aren't things that just everybody can go and grab and look at. So not only might you have some good chances of uh, success in finding vulnerabilities in those kind of products, not a lot of people have access. Who knows how to do that, like, magnifying glass thing on OS X? Anyone? Nobody? You want coffee or something? All right. Well, I'll just stare at it really small again. So you got that one. So uh, something that, that uh, I've seen a lot and that, that Steve kind of like coined a term here on this pig pile effect, it's pretty interesting. Uh, that's one way to select your target. You see uh, people beating up on something through advisories getting published and you're like, well, hey, maybe I feel like there might be more there. I should go take a look there and maybe do some follow-on work. Uh, I encourage the community with this one on stage right heavily. I think <coughs> it's good to have more people looking. So tools and techniques, um, there's kind of like uh, these two main ones that are really kind of high level, design review uh, and threat modeling. These are, I think, really important for anyone who's developing software uh, to have this as part of like the cycle of figuring out how, to, how to, to stay secure or how to basically stop having alarm bells ringing all the time. Uh, dynamic versus static analysis is, uh, is, is very important to differentiate depending on what kind of stuff you're going to do. Um, like on the malware side, static analysis is a lot more popular. Uh, with vulnerability research, a lot of more dynamic analysis is, it seems to be more popular. But I think the real power here is when you have both together. Uh, one, of, one of my personal bug hunting processes 
is to, to start writing a fuzzer and then just let it run while I read the code. And as soon as I learn something more about the code that will help the fuzzer be good, then I'll add it to the fuzzer. And I'll just keep doing that back and forth. Uh, so code auditing and some of these auto other automated tools, like uh, static code anal analyzers, they're great, but a lot of times uh, they have false positives or, or they have other issues. And so uh, it's just important to be aware of the trade-offs of kind of all of the tools and techniques when you start getting into them. I, I really think that a tool in this industry is the embodiment of a technique someone developed to, to a large degree. Yep, yeah, and I agree with that. And <clears throat> while we have a number of tools and techniques listed here, um, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to know all of them and be expert in all of them in order to find any kind of success. This is part of your path. Um, but we do recommend, I would say, to at least investigate and uh, look into each of these. Everyone kind of has their own sort of uh, favorite techniques that they like to do. This one's you, man. <clears throat> Um, so as the field becomes a, a little bit more mature um, and uh, uh, ties in obviously with vulnerability management overall, there's a number of different relevant standards that you should familiarize yourself with and, uh, and utilize wherever you can. Uh, one of the main ones is the common ident identification scheme for vulnerabilities called uh, CVE. And um, for those of you uh, who've uh, uh, who've had certain questions about CVE, especially uh, in the last year or so, with concerns about uh, coverage and what MITRE is doing. While I did leave CVE um, last year, I'm still at MITRE, and we do have uh, one of my colleagues here who is uh, 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 carrying the torch, as it were, and would love to talk to you. And so I want him to stand up here. Uh, that's Dan. Um, he will be... Hey, Stan. Good. We need to talk, buddy. So uh, he will be available, and he would, uh, and he would love to uh, love to talk to you. Um, not all of you at once, but uh, you know, a few at a, a few at a time. Uh, <laughs> another effort is the common weakness enumeration. This is um, uh, uh, when you have these different vulnerabilities in different products. Well, it turns out that programmers make the same mistakes, and many different programmers make the same mistakes. And so CWE is, essentially a, is effectively a classification scheme for um, how programmers uh, wind up making these kinds of mistakes. Um, it's uh, useful in two different ways. One as sort of a common identifier for um, characterizing what the mistake is that you found, but it also winds up being very useful as a dictionary or as uh, something to educate you. So for example, CWE covers 800 and different 800 different kinds of mistakes that programmers can make, and as much as you think you might know about everything, I guarantee you, there's one or two things in there that might surprise you or that you might not have expected. And if you're even just starting out, um, you get good in, you get good information from things such as OWASP, but CWEs as well for stuff like uh, SQL injection and cross-site scripting are also um, pretty mature. Uh, Equivalent for um, attacks is uh, is called KPEC, uh, and then CVSS is a way of being able to uh, consistently apply a uh, risk-related score to a particular vulnerability that you found. So it may be your favorite vulnerability. You might be in love with it. You might have worked really hard, uh, but you need the cold objective or reasonably objective eye of CVSS or something like that so that you can communicate its importance uh, uh, effectively. Thank you. Hey, sorry about messing with the slides. I was trying to zoom in on this little tiny thing and it zoomed everything. So that doesn't work. Uh, so disclosure models. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. There's, we're not going to go into specific details, but there are a number of different models that uh, you could consider and figure out more or less what works for you. Um, I do, and I think Josh agrees, that we both suggest using the coordinated disclosure model which involves uh, really uh, working with the, the vendor in order to try and re uh, reach some resolution. But there are other models as well, such as full disclosure. As soon as you find it, you sort of put it out, independent of whether or not the vendor's been given a chance to patch. And then there's also non-disclosure. Some people may choose simply not to disclose the vulnerabilities or um, to only uh, provide them or, uh, in some cases, sell them 
in uh, limited markets. But this is, this, these are different things that you're going to need to consider as you move more into vulnerability research. You may have any number of different um, approaches and beliefs in, in why it's important to do uh, public disclosure. Uh, but I think the, the more we know, the, the better we know, all of us uh, collectively. And finally, there are a couple different standards or standards like documents that um, will give you some guidance with respect to coordinated disclosure or equivalent models uh, that you can follow and that you can provide or give advice uh, to vendors who may not be used to uh, handling vulnerabilities. Most importantly is uh, International Standards Organization, ISO, uh, document number 29147, which was done by uh, Katie Masaurus and others. International standard, it is something that is directed towards vendors, which explains to them how to uh, uh, build up a process for responding to vulnerability reports and for interacting with uh, the researchers. So um, as a survivor of the disclosure wars, uh, I'm very, very happy to see standards like that um, 29147 come out. And yes, it did take me six months before I could start rattling off that number. <laughs> if you start to get deeper into um, uh, building your uh, vulnerability career, so to speak, then you may have different kinds of uh, considerations for building your own kind of public, uh, your own disclosure policy. Uh, based on your own experiences and your own beliefs, you, you want to start evolving certain kind of considerations for what you're going to do in certain kind of circumstances. So what do you think, what would you do if you try and contact a vendor and you can't find any contact information? Or what happens if you're working through a process and then suddenly an, the uh, vulnerability is released by somebody else as a zero day or something like that? There's a lot of debate about uh, how long to actually give the vendor before they fix the vulnerability and push it out, uh, push out a patch. Some say 30 days, some say 60 days, there's 90 days, or however long it takes. These are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. Yeah. What? Let's, uh, let's I, I had a point. I forgot what it was, though. Yeah. Let's skip this one. Oh, I think I was gonna, just going to say that uh, sometimes the disclosure process you choose will even vary, you know, based on individual vulnerabilities. Some people decide not to disclose things that are not super awesome. All right, so uh, we got 10 minutes. We lost a little time to the yeah, technical yeah. difficulties. Okay. So let's, uh, we can move on, I think. You want to skip that one? Yep. All right, so let's talk a little bit about advisory structure and contents. I'm so not going to read these bullets to you, but like, um, Structured content is is very useful. I think Steve and I collectively, well, we probably read a lot of the same advisories, but collectively, he's probably read thousands and thousands of advisories. I'd agree with that. And and it's like, it, it, some of them were really horrible. There's this really offensive group, uh, and when I say offensive, I mean when we read it, we get offended. Uh, I don't mean they use bad words or anything. Yep. Just, not to name names, but yes. Yeah, well, I'm not naming any names. You, you'll, if anybody reads advisories, they'll figure it out pretty soon. So, so these are just some uh, fields and, and some guidance uh, that we have for, for making uh, advisories. And of course, there's some more here. Uh, one of the big ones is um, proof concept code. Uh, I think it's a really important, uh, really important sort of thing to prove your case. Um, you know, when you, when you disclose a vulnerability to a vendor, a lot of times you get pushback like there's not even a real issue here. Uh, and, and uh, of course, on the Metasploit side of things, it is a little bit hard to argue with a shell, but uh, you don't necessarily have to give somebody a shell uh, as your proof of concept. It could be, could be whatever you choose. It could be a sequence of steps that they manage to follow to, to verify it. It could be um, you know, any kind of level of maturity proof of concept code, crash, crash proof of concepts. But, but do remember, like, uh, the more sort of detailed information you can learn and extract and provide to them, the easier it's going to be for them uh, to deal with that information. So one of the reasons that we have these particular details here uh, about advisory contents is that 
a lot of researchers, especially beginning researchers, don't necessarily know what information to provide. Or you might submit a bug report to a bug bounty and it comes back and says you're not providing enough information or you're not communicating clearly. So uh, those fields that we have listed and you know, are on the slides and, and will be on an updated version of this slide, uh, we encourage you to um, really look at those and uh, consider seriously capturing all of the, that, that information. There are some pros and cons that we came up with. Uh, this is basically but just Steve and I kind of ranting on all the stuff we didn't like about various advisories. Uh, you know, we want people to do simpler, simple stuff. Uh, plain text is real easy. It's very portable. Uh, it has a very low attack surface. So, As opposed to, say, PDF? Yeah, which is like a web browser, basically. And uh, some people do like to do videos, and uh, we think that's kind of cool, but uh, I have a couple of suggestions here. One of the main ones being is, you know, respect the, the viewer of the videos. You don't want to make your videos too long, um, but you don't want to go too quickly either. Um, and uh, uh, there's a couple other considerations up there as well. So you want to be mindful even of the format in which your uh, advisory goes out. This one, me? Okay, yep. so, so what to expect from vendors? Uh, I already mentioned some of this stuff. You can expect total cluelessness. Uh, you, can, uh, you can expect, in some cases, for people to threaten you with their legal teams. Uh, I don't know why they do this. I think they're confused. But, uh, you know, these are just a bunch of, a bunch of possibilities. Uh, Basically, honestly, every... Most, most good companies these days, especially the bigger ones, they're very open to work with. And actually, amazingly, even sometimes a new vendor that's never had to deal with these problems comes out uh, actually understanding it quite easily and being very well, good to work with as well. But one thing to keep in mind is that it's not like one size fits all all the time and every disclosure yeah. winds up being some kind of unique snowflake. So you need to be able to be patient, as mentioned before, and also be able to be flexible. Keep an open mind. Uh, so. <clears throat> On the first, I think the first bullet, like one time uh, at iDefense, we were trying to report this vuln, and uh, I tried phone calls, I tried email, well, on the other order, of course, tried emails and then phone calls, and finally I got a response from the security guy there when I faxed him the advisory. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And what year was that? Uh, it was probably 2007. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they were like, oh, this came out of the fax machine. Uh, <laughs> let's call them. Okay. So uh, where do we disclose publicly? What we like to see is uh, people to disclose publicly uh, in places that are archived forever. So that becomes mailing list, basically. Uh, and these other, these other things on the list, like exploit DBs and vulnerability databases, those, those sites are great. Uh, and we'll hope they'll live forever, but in, ca in some cases in the past they have not lived forever. Uh, and ultimately those sites generally are pulling from uh, more public sites that are archived forever anyway. So th this is just our preference if you want to, you know, put your stuff on your blog uh, to, for, to have, you know, gain readership, that's great. But maybe also throw a note up on one of these lists to get the traffic to your blog as well. So common mistakes to avoid, uh, you know, number one, is don't test other people's stuff unless you, they let you. Uh, I think there was one case with Facebook bug bounty program where a guy like owned the hell out of them basically and then tried to do a bug bounty with them. And that I don't think worked out really well for that guy. <laughs> uh, we have here uh, on this slide in the next one, we aren't gonna go into details, especially because we're running low on time. Yeah. But there are a lot of common mistakes um, that many researchers make, including ourselves actually. And uh, so why don't we move ahead? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Another... If you guys want to hear some war stories, just hit yep. us up afterwards. <clears throat> we have some real meat to the um, t at the tail end of, of this presentation. Yep. So okay, so this is one of the one of the main ones here. This is just sort of our own model and our first crack at this. As far as we know, nobody else has really sort of started on this, but um, it, we're trying to outline uh, different kinds of stages of growth that you might encounter in, in your career or in your technical abilities when you're doing vulnerability research. So when you're just starting out, you're starting at a more or less a newbie phase. You might have, uh, you might know just like one uh, crude technique uh, that you apply against, um, you know, easy software and maybe you make a lot of different mistakes. 
At some point, once you become more familiar with things, you may reach what we call a uh, workhorse stage, where you know a number of different kinds of basic vulnerability types, you can generally find multiple issues, uh, and then you start to really more or less get a hang of uh, certain kind of processes. Then when you start to move more towards the subject matter uh, expert, these are, the, these are the times when you're really like watching and looking for the newest and latest uh, techniques that other people develop. Or you might, uh, you might go and extend those techniques that have already been reported. And um, you're more or less pretty much um, treated or assumed as being reliable by you know, uh, people like me and so on. Uh, and um, at, at some point you start to really have a clear sense of like what your own disclosure policy is. And you can be relied on to find a lot of things and to write a really good, solid uh, quality report. And finally, uh, upon reaching the elite stage, which not everyone needs to reach the elite stage, and not everyone has to, and not everyone wants to. And that's perfectly cool, because there are way more vulnerabilities out there than there are vulnerability researchers to handle them. But uh, what, what I think of a little bit of as a, an elite researcher is you discover or invent new vulnerability classes, or you develop entirely new techniques, um, or... Uh, 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 you know, you give you give conference talks and so on. You really sort of uh, uh, um, push the industry forward, and that can take a number of years. You're not just going to read a book or look at a couple blog posts and be elite tomorrow um, or next year. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, it takes time uh, for sure. Uh, well, I can't read this again. So uh, that's so everyone, got my name uh, on uh, it anyway. Yeah, so okay, well, you're then. free. Um, I think we got only a minute or something like that. Yep. So uh, one thing about the, about the notion of growth is that there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, which basically says it takes around 10,000 hours of um, focused, effective practice in order to reach a level of expertise. And so you can do the math, and that number may be questionable, but that's something uh, really to keep in mind. But there are a couple different ways that you could progress a little bit further if you want. I think we have like three slides left. Yep. Do you want to do this one or you want me to do it? Okay, yeah. It's got your name on it. But, uh, I'll do it if you want. Okay. You getting tired? No, we're getting, we're getting get, an X get from ushers. the June, so they're Get out of here, guys. You talk too much. So um, we just wanted to leave on this note about feelings and fails, right? We mentioned we, we are not perfect. Uh, I believe there's this thing. This is what I call the, the human condition, which basically means uh, you always make mistakes and have to deal with things that you, uh, your body tells you and such. But uh, uh, feelings are, are definitely a part of that. So... Feels are remember feelings are okay. Uh, there are a number of times when you're doing some deep research and you get very discouraged. You might want to find something easy to do. You may want to uh, go at it a different way and maybe just go to the beach for a while. So uh, another another one of these things is uh, you feel like you really got to keep going and you want to work really hard because you're addicted to something, but it's been like 17 hours that you've been working on it. It might be a good time to sleep. Um, so yeah, I mean, feelings are okay, yeah. and uh, failing, failures are okay too. So here we go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we are available to talk to anybody afterwards down yeah. at Knox. Yeah, we're gonna go down down the escalator somewhere there. <laughs>